Good morning. Welcome to our Wednesday morning Bible class. We're continuing with our study of Abraham that we started last week. Abraham and his trials and his triumphs. And there's a number of reasons why we, why we look at Abraham. But first, let's look to the Lord with that privilege called prayer. Lord, we thank you for the many promises that you've given us, just as you gave Abraham. And above all, that promise of salvation through your dear son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, just as you did for Abraham, that you gave us the faith to believe those promises and to wait for the fulfillment of that promise in heaven. Be with us now as we study your word so that our faith in our Savior may be strengthened and that our trust in your promises may ever grow. We ask this in the Savior's name. Amen. We started last week with the study of Abraham, and as I mentioned, uh, our general theme is his trials and his triumphs. And he's a good one to look at uh, because he's mentioned so prominently in, in, all, in all of Holy Scripture, both the Old and the New Testaments. But particularly do we look at Abraham because we look then at Abraham's God, what a faithful God he was and is, and the promises he gave Abraham, and how he very faithfully kept those promises, and then gave Abraham the faith to trust in those promises also. Now we're on page three of our, of our study guide, and we looked at point B, by grace, God called Abraham, gave him great promises and the faith to believe them. Pastor, would you read us Genesis 12? Sure. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. We looked last time at uh, where Abraham was at this time when the Lord came to him, and he with his father had already moved from Ur 600 miles closer to the land of Palestine to the city of Haran. And that's where the Lord came to Abraham with a tremendous promise now, we have to ask ourselves, why in the world did he pick Abraham? I wonder how many people there were in the world at that time, or how many Shemites, you know, he was a descendant of that son of, of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, uh, that uh, uh, he came to this Abraham. And that takes us to that looking at that mysterious and yet very comforting doctrine that we call election. Let's just take a couple passages and uh, look at those, and then we'll talk a little bit about election. Look at Isaiah 51, verse 2. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who gave you birth. When I called him, he was but one, and I blessed him and made him many. You notice the pronouns there? Who called whom? God called him. God called Abraham. Who promised blessings because of that call? It's all God. Yeah. So why in the world God did this for Abraham out of the many, many people uh, that were alive in those days carries us, of course, to the grace of our Lord. Nehemiah 9, verse 7. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. So who chose him? The Lord God. Did Abraham send a letter to God and say, Here I am, I'm available? No. no, no. The Lord in his mercy and grace chose Abraham. And 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. Who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So why did God called Abraham? What was there in Abraham that caught, that uh, moved him to call him? Nothing in Abraham it was all about what was in God, the grace in his heart. And that takes us to that mysterious and yet very comforting teaching that we call election. Now you know, people get into trouble when they try to answer that question, why did God choose some and not others? And that's because they want answers out of their own little 
a thing called the mind or the reason. And they come up with false answers. One uh, false answer is to point the finger to God and say, you know, God chose some for salvation and some for damnation. Mm -hmm. And there are religions, some prominent ones, that teach that. That would make whom responsible when people go to hell? It's God's fault. That's God's fault, yeah. In fact, we know that's not right because Scripture says, how many people does God want to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? All people to be All saved. All people. Or they point the finger to God <coughs> and uh, they say, well, you know, God saw in that person uh, something that made him choose that person as if that person uh, was uh, worthy of being chosen by the Lord to go to, into eternity. And that, that would mean that when that person gets to heaven, he would, he would be able to stand before God and say, I'm here, you know, partly because of your grace in Christ and partly because of me. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know that salvation is entirely grace. Then they point the finger at man. And they say, well, that God chose that person because he was easier to bring to faith. <laughs> And what does scripture tell us about the human heart? We're all spiritually dead, blind, and hostile to God. Yeah, yeah. Each one of us is the worst enemy of God, not, not uh, somewhat friendly to him. Or they'll point uh, to the individual and say, ah, he was worthy because of the life that he was going to lead that God should choose him. No, when it comes to the choosing like Abraham, like you, like me, it's entirely... God's gift of grace already in eternity that he chose us. And now people are going to ask, how do I know that I'm among the elect? Mm. You know, and there's a real good answer for that. Mm. The people who ask that question look at man instead of looking at God. If I'm going to answer that question, how do I know that I'm among the elect? I have to look at what God's doing for me. What's mm. he doing for me right now? He's bringing me and keeping me in faith, right? Certainly. What's he doing for me right now? Washing me clean with Jesus' blood and reminding me that, that he's done that. What's he doing for me right now? Assuring me that heaven is my home. Mm -hmm. And uh, there I, for I know, looking at what God is doing, not what I am doing, that I'm among the elect. And some will say that's not fair. And I always tell the story... You're on a cruise ship. Yeah, if you were on a cruise ship right now, you'd be quarantined. <laughs> <laughs> but you're on a cruise ship, and it goes down. And the SOS goes out, and there's a freighter nearby that rushes to the scene to save people. And you're in the water with all the other passengers splashing around, dog paddling. And they throw you a life ring, and you grab it, and they pull you up on the deck. And there's the captain, and you stand before that captain, and you say, What about all those people down there, captain? Instead, what are you going to say? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, right. right. And so that's our attitude when it comes to that teaching of election. And Abraham is a model of saying, Thank you, thank you, thank you. So when Abraham was chosen, it was not because of Abraham, but because of God. Let's dissect a little bit that tremendous promise that God gave Abraham. Seven promises. So first of all, what does he say to Abraham? I will make you into a great nation. Numerically, right? Mm -hmm. Politically, spiritually, right? You know, this is kind of funny because how old is Abraham at this time? I think he's 75. Yeah, and how old is Sarah? Boy, I don't know. 65. 65, okay. 10 years younger, right. Always marry a young woman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and here he, he, he comes to Abraham and he says, you're going to be a great nation in all these aspects. The next promise, what does he say? I will bless you. And, of course, the human mind immediately thinks of earthly blessings. Abram was a millionaire, mm -hmm. or maybe more, in today's value. Mm -hmm, sure. God made him, everything go well for him in life, too, eventually. And 
uh, the best part was, what was his greatest blessing? That he knew the Lord, the Lord as his Savior. So the next promise was, and I'll make your name great. Yeah, you know, even the Arabs honor and revere mm -hmm. Abraham. Yeah, you know, great, your name great. The next one, you will be a blessing. And we see that in his life, helping a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and on and on and on. But above all, uh, blessing for us. Don't we get blessing today when we're studying Abraham? Sure. Look, and he's still he's still a blessing. And the next one, I will bless those who bless you. That through him there's blessing that comes to people. And the next one, whoever curses you, I will curse. Did you notice when he said, I will bless all those who bless you? He's got a large number. Here he's got the singular. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's the singular. Uh, not many, but uh, some will, of course, uh, be enemies of Abraham and, of course, then of the promises that God gave Abraham. And the main one, the last one, all people on earth will be blessed through you. Not through Abraham's life and what he, and how he led that life, but through what? That special descendant that would come from his family line. You know, I wish that uh, many of our people could go and visit a world mission field. When you stand in the midst of the crowds, like in Brazil, uh, Africa, you know, where I've had the privilege, Nigeria and Cameroon to visit, and you look at all those people, and then you look at the chosen, you know, the, the believers, uh, you, first of all, you can't escape the feeling of God's grace in your own life. Secondly, you can't escape the importance of mission work, of trying to reach those people with the gospel. Now, who knows who among those people is among God's elect, right? And the gospel is, is what we need to bring to those so that they then will, re, will be among God's elect and stand with him in eternity. We take that so for granted in, in uh, situations like we're in here at mm -hmm. Good Shepherd. Mm -hmm. We sit down, well, not these days, but soon again, we sure hope. And uh, we take for granted that uh, we're among the elect, right? Mm -hmm. And then, then if only God would open our eyes and show us the many, many people out there who still need that gospel message. You know, there's a hymn that I love that ends up by saying, Love that found me wondrous sought, sought me when I sought him not. So Abraham, great promise. Now let's go on to the next uh, passage, Genesis chapter 12. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So how does Abraham show his faith? Remember I said that only once in Scripture does it say Abraham believed the Lord. How do we know that he believed? How does he show it? He obeyed and he did what God said. He did what God said. And you know what's remarkable about all of this? We find out that uh, he didn't even know where he was going. <laughs> now, read that first passage, Hebrews 11, 8. By faith Abraham, when called to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. You know, back in 1960, when I graduated from the seminary, there was no call day. <laughs> After the Conference of Presidents had issued the calls, the president of the seminary called us together in a room and called our name and handed out our call. And uh, I got the call to work in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Canada, mm -hmm. first mission of our synod in Canada out of my 
classmates, you know, who went to Dakota, Montana, and, and so on. And Charlene and I had no idea where we were going. Mission Board was green as grass when it came to how to get in, uh, what, what do we need for legal papers to get in, what kind of uh, moving we had to have, a bonded carrier, etc., etc. And you had a little bit of the feeling of Abraham, you know, what are we getting into? Mm -hmm. But we went. We went, thank God for his grace and calling and, and giving you the, the uh, power to follow his call. But just think of Abraham having to leave everything behind, everything, even his, his family, you know, his relatives. He left it all behind and he went. So he went because he trusted the Lord's promise. How does verse 5 indicate that Abram considered this move to be permanent? He took everything, all of his belongings, all of his workers, everything. Didn't he keep a condo back? In no, there? no, <laughs> this was permanent. Didn't he keep some furniture there? Mm -hmm. No, no. Didn't he keep a car in the garage mm -hmm. just in case? No, this was permanent. He left everything behind. And who lived in the land when Abram arrived? Yeah, it was an open country. There were Canaanites living there already. That's right. The land was filled with the enemy. And they weren't going to say, Welcome, Abraham. Here's the welcome club. Come to bring you a basket of goodies and welcome you to our land. They would resist him because he would come with flocks and herds. And, and in those days, you know, green grass was, you know, grazing was uh, the way they fed their herds. And wasn't much grass to be eaten either in, in that semi-arid country. What assurance did God give Abraham that the land would be his? He appeared to him and he said, I'm giving you this land. Yeah, yeah. He said, I'll give this land to you. And who stood behind that promise? The Lord God with his own reputation. What if I would promise to give uh, Katrina a hundred thousand dollars. You know, I won the lottery. No, I, let's not use that word. <laughs> Would you believe me, Katrina? Why not? Couldn't back it up, right? <laughs> I couldn't back it up. I don't have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. <laughs> if I would, I'd make a good check out to Good Shepherd. There you go. <laughs> but here, Abraham believed God because... He had $100,000 in the bank, God did, you know. God's uh, power to keep his promises is unlimited. When he makes a promise, you can take it to the bank, right? right. You, you can depend on it. And so when he promises that uh, he will be with his people, even through this coronavirus thing, you can take it to the bank. Right. If you lose your job during this uh, whole episode, if... Uh, you, you lost business contacts, so, oh, we can go on and on. You can take it to the bank that the Lord knows what he's doing, right? And that out of it, what will he bring? He's going to work for our spiritual good. He's going to work for our spiritual good. From the high side of Abraham and his uh, steadfast and strong trust in the Lord's promises, we come to a low side. And uh, as we go through it, I think there's a lesson for us in this too. How Abraham trusts the Lord, and then comes the point where his, his knees get a little feeble, and he bends a little bit underneath a, a circumstance. Read us Genesis 12:10 and following. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female don donkeys, men servants and maid servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. 
So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. So as we said, kind of a dark episode in Abraham's life, and this is early on, too, in his following God's promises. What caused him to go down to Egypt? Terrible famine. Yeah, remember now, he's uh, grazing his cattle and living and tenting in a semi-arid uh, part of the country, and there's not enough or not much pasturage there for his animals. And, of course, when the rain doesn't come and what happens to the feed, it, it dries up. And there was one place you could go, the same place that uh, Joseph's family went to, and that was to Egypt because of the Nile River. The Nile with its water was uh, life-giving. In fact, Egypt was known to be the breadbasket of, of the world at that time. So Abraham heads uh, down, down to Egypt with that marvelous Nile River. And, of course, he had one problem. He had a good-looking wife. Huh, how old was she at this time? 65, at least. And, and it says she was very beautiful. Yeah, well, I always thought my wife at 65 was beautiful, too. I always <laughs> told her, just as pretty as the day I married you. <laughs> yeah, but she was. And uh, in those days, of course, they lived uh, much longer. And, and Pharaoh, of course, had his harem. And what was this uh, despotic ruler looking for? Additions to his harem. And here's a good-looking lady, and so he was afraid that... Uh, uh, Abraham was afraid that he would gobble up his wife. Look at Genesis 17, verse 17. Abram fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? And look at the next passage. Sarah lived to be a hundred and twenty-seven years old. Oh, that brings up the question, why did people live so long in those days? You know, we don't know... I, the, my simple answer is God wanted to populate the earth, and so he allowed people. I mean, people can look at some natural reasons, but I just, God in the beginning wanted to populate the world. Sure. And there, I think there's another reason, too. When did Moses write the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses? About 1500 B.C. Yeah. What kept the gospel promise going until the written record was given? It was all oral transmission, oral family trans to family. Yes, family to family. Now, we kind of forget that today, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have the written word, thank God for that. But the, the Lord uses us now not to transmit the gospel only orally, but to use that written word as we orally transmit the gospel uh, to, to our children. You know, it's interesting in the uh, account of, on Easter Sunday of Jesus walking with the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, how did he convince them that he was the risen Christ? Did he pull rank? Did he say, look, I'm Jesus? What did he do? Well, he took them through a, a journey through the Bible and reminded them of everything he told them. Yes, just think of that. The living word pointed to the written word. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lesson for us too, isn't there? If we want to see the living word, where do we look? I look in the written word of the Bible. We look to the written word. And so I think God let people live that long in order to transmit the gospel until uh, the Holy Spirit had it uh, uh, written by the inspired authors. Mm -hmm. Now, what was Abraham's uh, subterfuge here? What did he say? Well, he lied. He, he didn't let anyone know that this was his wife. He said this was his sister. So that takes us to Genesis 20, verse 11. Abram replied, I said to myself, There is surely no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, This is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. So what was really the relationship 
the blood relationship of Sarah to Abraham? A half-sister. A half-sister, yeah. isn't that something? Today, if you want to get married, I think in many of the states, you can't marry somebody who is closer to you than a first cousin. Than a first cousin, yes, yeah. the law of consanguinity. In fact, the Lord even points that out in the Old Testament. Why? Well, I think our genes are too close, and so if you were intermarrying with someone, it would probably cause some birth defects. Yes. Why, well, why could Abraham marry his half-sister? I think back then, maybe there was still enough separation between the genes. <laughs> yes, or maybe not as much deterioration mm -hmm. huh, in the genes as, as uh, we have today, so we have to protect uh, the bloodline uh, with, the, with the laws. Now look at Abraham's reaction here. What kind of com which commandments do you see Abraham breaking? Well, he he told a lie. I guess that's the seventh commandment. Um, first commandment, he didn't trust in God to take care of him. And I would even say the fifth commandment. You know, he didn't really protect his wife. His wife was taken advantage of in this situation. In the sixth commandment. The sixth is marriage. Yeah. 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 Man alive. Uh, and maybe we could throw the ninth and tenth in there, sure, too, huh? sure, sure. Yeah. So maybe uh, more than a handful of God's commandments, Abraham was breaking. Why? What was wrong with him? Well, the main thing is he didn't trust God to take care of him. So he worked out his own plan. Does that ever happen to us? Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. We have to help God out a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would always tell the kids, yes, of course God expects you to do your best. But after you've done your best in a situation, let God do the rest. Mm -hmm. you know, trust Him to take care of it. Or I would tell them, pray as if everything depended on God. Work as if everything depended on you. Sure. Yeah. And Abraham kind of forgot that. And then it all began with that very first commandment, not trusting the Lord and his promises. And, of course, the Lord's up there. And what did he do to Pharaoh? He uh, punished Pharaoh with all kinds of serious diseases because of what he had done. And so Pharaoh uh, recognized what was going on. And gives Sarah back, and also animals, you know, cattle. And Abraham, chastened by the Lord, why, uh, goes home, enriched also by the Lord through Pharaoh. Now, why do you think that the, that uh, Moses recorded this, this incident about uh, Abraham? Well, I can think of a couple thoughts. Number one, it, it emphasizes again, God chose Abraham by grace, not because he was so good. It, it warns us about how we try to sometimes rationalize sin mm -hmm. um, and uh, teaches us to put God first in our life. Ever been in Abraham's shoes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that the Lord records the black scenes from uh, his great believers' lives so that I'm encouraged, you know, to sure. look at myself and I have to say... <laughs> I <laughs> know Abraham, no right. way, no how. Yeah. And the Lord then says to me, yeah, yeah, and it's not that you are so strong in the faith, it's that I will keep your faith strong in my promises. And when you falter along the way, I'll pick you up. Yeah, it, it, you know, if we think Abraham's so up here, well, I can never be him, but I realize it was Abraham's God I think one of my professors said the Old Testament is a history of God's faithful love to his unfaithful people. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and we're unfaithful, but we have the same faithful God taking care of us. Now what about Abraham's white lie? It was really partially true, wasn't it? Is there ever room for white lies in, <laughs> in the lives of God's people? What do you think? You know, if... Uh, if your wife says, do you really love that hot dish? I don't know that you have to be totally uh, painfully honest about it. But I think you got to look at the motives here. He was doing this because he didn't trust God and he wasn't protecting his wife. It, to me, it wasn't a white lie. Even if it was true, 
it was not proper because it was not showing love to God and it was not showing love to his wife. Yeah, I think uh, Luther once wrote that there is no room for white lives in the life of a Christian uh, because regardless how you rationalize it, there's still sin involved in that white lie. Mm -hmm. Either it's not trusting the Lord uh, or it's uh, being afraid to tell the truth to a Christian. Uh, and sometimes in our ministry we get into this too where you walk into a room and uh, you know the person is terminally ill with cancer but maybe uh, the doctor and family hasn't told the patient that well, how do you answer am I dying pastor mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. my answer was ask your family sure. and the family sometimes would come and say pastor will you tell mom that uh, uh, that, that she's on her way to heaven and I would say no you tell her mm -hmm. and then as soon as you've told her I'll come in behind you sure. and uh, tell her that heaven's a good place to go, you know. Yep. yep. Yeah, so that uh, I think we need to be careful when it comes to eh, kind of circumventing the truth. Uh, and, and as you said, look at our motives when it comes to that. That's good, I think, then. Did we finish this section? Yep. Okay. Is, is that it? Very good. Thank you. Have a great day.